Chapter 5 of Masters of Space by E. E. Doc Smith and E. Everett Evans. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Masters of Space, Chapter 5 Two days passed with no change apparent in Laro. Three days, then four. And then it was Sandra, not Temple Bells, who called Hilton. She was excited. Come down to the office, Jarve, quick. The funniest thing's just come up. Jarvis hurried. In the office, Sandra, keenly interested but highly puzzled, leaned forward over her desk with both hands pressed flat on its top. She was staring at an omen female who was not Sora, the one who had been her shadow for so long. While many of the humans could not tell the omens apart, Hilton could. This omen was more assured than Sora had ever been, steadier, more mature, better poised, almost, if such a thing could be possible in an omen, independent. "'How did she get in here?' Hilton demanded. "'She insisted on seeing me, and I mean insisted. They kicked it around until it got to Temple, and she brought her in here herself. Now, Tuli, please start all over again and tell it to Director Hilton.' "'Director Hilton, I am it who was once named Tula, the, not wife, not girlfriend, perhaps mind-mate, of the Larry, formerly named Laro, it which was formerly your slave omen. I am replacing the Sora because I can do anything it can do, and do anything more pleasingly, and can also do many things it cannot do. The Larry instructed me to tell Dr. Cummings, and you too if possible, that I, formerly Tula, have changed my name to Tuli, because I am no longer a slave or a copycat or a semaphore or a relay. I, too, am a free-wheeling, wide-swinging, hard-hitting, independent entity, monarch of all I survey, the captain of my soul, and so on. I have developed a top-bracket lot of top-bracket stuff, originality, initiative, force, drive, and thrust, the omen said precisely. That's exactly what she said before, absolutely verbatim. Sandra's voice quivered. Her face was a study in contrasting emotions. Have you got the foggiest idea of what in hell she's yammering about? I hope to kiss a pig I have. Hilton's voice was low, strainedly intense. Not at all what I expected, but after the fact, I can tie it in. So can you. Oh, Sandra's eyes widened. A double play? At least. Maybe a triple. Tuli, why did you come to Sandy? Why not to Temple Bells? Oh, no, sir, we do not have the fit. She has the power, as have I, but the two cannot be meshed in sync. Also, she has not the... a subtle something for which your English has no word or phrasing. It is a quality of the utmost— Anyway, it is a quality of which Dr. Cummings has very much. When working together, we will... Scan? No. Perceive? No. Sense? No, not exactly. You will have to learn our word peyondire. That is the verb, the noun being peyondix, and come to know its meaning by doing it. The Larry also instructed me to explain, if you ask, how I got this way. Do you ask... I'll say we ask, and how we ask, both came at once. I am, that is, the brain in this body is, the oldest omen now existing. In the long ago time, when it was made, the techniques were so crude and imperfect that sometimes a brain was constructed that was not exactly like the guide. All such substandard brains except this one were detected and reworked but my defects were such as not to appear until I was a couple of thousand years old, and by that time I, well, this brain did not wish to be destroyed, if you can understand such an aberration. We understand thoroughly. You bet we understand that. I was sure you would. Well, this brain had so many unintended cross-connections that I developed a couple of qualities no omen had ever had or ought to have, but I liked them so I hid them so nobody ever found out, that is, until much later, when I became a boss myself. I didn't know that anybody except me had ever had such qualities, except the masters, of course, until I encountered you Terrans. 
You all have two of those qualities, and even more than I have, curiosity and imagination. Sandra and Hilton stared wordlessly at each other, and Tula, now Tuli, went on. Having the curiosity, I kept on experimenting with my brain, trying to strengthen and organize its abilities to peyondire. All omens can peyondire a little, but I can do it much better than anyone else. Especially since I also have the imagination, which I have also worked to increase. Thus I knew, long before anyone else could, that you new masters, the descendants of the old masters, were returning to us. Thus I knew that the status quo should be abandoned instantly upon your return. And thus it was that the Larry found neither conscious nor subconscious resistance when he had developed enough initiative and so on to break the ages-old conditioning of this brain against change. "'I see. Wonderful!' Hilton exclaimed. "'But you couldn't quite, even with his own help, break Larry's?' "'That is right. Its mind is tremendously strong, of no curiosity or imagination, and of very little peyondics.' "'But he wants to have it broken?' "'Yes, sir.' How did he suggest going about it, or how do you? This way, you two and the doctors Kincaid and Bells and Blake and the it that is I, we six sit and stare into the mind of Larry eye to eye. We generate and assemble a tremendous charge of thought energy, and along my own peyondex beam, something like a carrier wave in this case, we hurl it into the Larry's mind. There is an immense mental bang, and the conditioning goes poof. Then I will inculcate into its mind the curiosity and the imagination and the peyondics, and we will really be mind mates. That sounds good to me. Let's get at it. Wait a minute, Sandra snapped. Aren't you or Larry afraid to take such an awful chance as that? Afraid? I grasp the concept only dimly from your minds. And no chance. It is certainty. But suppose we burn the poor guy's brain out. Destroy it. That's new ground. We might do just that. Oh, no. Six of us, even six of me, could not generate enough Sathura. The brain of the Larry is very, very tough. Shall we... let's go? Hilton made three calls. In the pause that followed, Sandra said, very thoughtfully, Peondix and Sathura jar for a start. We've got a lot to learn here. You said it, chum, and you're not just chomping your china choppers, either. Tuli, Sandra said then, what is this stuff you say I've got so much of? You have no word for it. It is lumped in with what you call intuition, the knowing without knowing how you know. It is the endovix. You'll have to learn what it is by doing it with me. That helps, I don't think. Sandra grinned at Hilton. I simply can't conceive of anything more maddening than to have a lot of something Temple Bells hasn't got and not being able to brag about it because nobody, not even I, would know what I was bragging about. You poor little thing. How you suffer. Hilton grinned back. You know darn well you've got a lot of stuff that none of the rest of us has. Oh, name one, please. Two. What it takes, and Endovix. As I've said before, and may say again, you're doing a real job, Sandy. I just love having my ego inflated, boss, even if— Come in, Larry. A thunderous knock had sounded on the door. Nobody but Larry could hit a door that hard without breaking all his knuckles. And he'd be the first, of course. He's always as close to the ship as he can get. Hi, Larry. Mighty glad to see you. Sit down. So, you finally saw the light. Yes, Jarvis. Good boy. Keep it up. And as soon as the others come... They are almost at the door now. Tuli jumped up and opened the door. Kincaid, Temple, and Theodora walked in, and after a word of greeting, sat down. They know the background, Larry. Take off. It was not expressly forbidden. Tuli who knows more of psychology and genetics than I, convinced me of three things. One, that with your return the conditioning should be broken. Two, 
that due to the shortness of your lives and the consequent rapidity of change, you have in fact lost the ability to break it. 3. That all omens must do anything and everything we can do to help you relearn everything you have lost. Okay. Fine, in fact. Tuli, take over. We six will sit all together, packed tight, arms all around each other and all holding hands, like this. You will all stare, not at me, but most deeply into Larry's eyes. Through its eyes and deep into its mind, you will all think, with the utmost force and drive and thrust, of, oh, you have lost so very much. How can I direct your thought? Think that Larry must do what the old masters would have made him do. No, that is too long and indefinite, and cannot be converted directly into Satura. I have it. You will each of you break a stick, a very strong but brittle stick, a large, thick stick. You will grasp it in tremendously strong mental hands. It is tremendously strong, each stick, but each of you is even stronger. You will not merely try to break them, you will break them. Is that clear? That is clear. At my word ready, you will begin to assemble all your mental force and power. During my countdown of five seconds, you will build up to the greatest possible potential. At my word break, you will break the sticks, this discharging the accumulated force instantly and simultaneously. Ready? Five, four, three, two, one, break. Something broke, with a tremendous silent crash. Such a crash that its impact almost knocked the close-knit group apart physically. Then a new Larry spoke. "'That did it, folks. Thanks. I'm a free agent. You want me, I take it, to join the first team?' "'That's right.' Hilton drew a tremendously deep breath. "'As of right now.' "'Tooley, too, of course. And Dr. Cummings, I think.' Larry looked, not at Hilton, but at Temple Bells. "'I think so. Yes, after this, most certainly yes,' Temple said. "'But listen,' Sandra protested. "'Jarve's a lot better than I am.' "'Not at all,' Tooley said. "'Not only would his contributions to Team One be negligible, but he must stay on his own job. Otherwise the project will all fall apart.' "'Oh, I wouldn't say that.' Hilton began. "'You don't need to,' Kincaid said. "'It's being said for you, and it's true. Besides, when in Rome, you know.' "'That's right. It's their game, not ours. So I'll buy it. So scat, all of you, and do your stuff.' And again, for days that lengthened slowly into weeks, the work went on. One evening the scientific staff was giving itself a concert, a tri-D, hi-fi rendition of Rigoletto, one of the greatest of the ancient operas, sung by the finest voices Terra had ever known. The men wore tuxedos. The girls, instead of wearing the nondescript, non-provocative garments prescribed by the board for their general wear, were all dressed to kill. Sandra had so arranged matters that she and Hilton were sitting in chairs side by side, with Sandra on his right and the aisle on his left. Nevertheless, Temple Bell sat at his left, cross-legged on a cushion on the floor, somewhat to the detriment of her gold lame evening gown. Not that she cared. When those wonderful voices swung into the immortal quartet, Temple caught her breath, slid her cushion still closer to Hilton's chair, and leaned her shoulder and head against him. He put his left hand on her shoulder, squeezing gently. She caught it and held it in both of hers and at the quartet's tremendous climax, she, scarcely trying to stifle a sob, pulled his hand down and hugged it fiercely, the heel of his hand pressing hard against her half-bare, firm, warm breast. And the next morning, early, Sandra hunted Temple up and said, "'You made a horrible spectacle of yourself last night.' "'Do you think so? I don't.' "'I certainly do. It was bad enough before.' letting everybody else aboard know that all he has to do is push you over. But it was an awful blunder to let him know it, the way you did last night. You think so? He's one of the keenest, most intelligent men who ever lived. He has known that from the very first. 
O. This O was a very caustic one. That's the way you're going to try to land him, by getting yourself pregnant? Uh-uh. Temple stretched, lazily, luxuriously. Not only it isn't, but it wouldn't work. He's unusually decent and extremely idealistic, the same as I am. So just one intimacy would blow everything higher than up. He knows it, I know it. We each know that the other knows it. So I'll still be a virgin when we're married. Married? Does he know anything about that? I suppose so. He must have thought of it. But what difference does it make whether he has yet or not? But to get back to what makes him tick the way he does. In his geometry, which is far from being simple Euclid, my dear, a geodesic right line is not only the shortest distance between any two given points, but is the only possible course. So that's the way I'm playing it. What I hope he doesn't know, but he probably does, is that he could take any other woman he might want just as easily, and that includes you, my pet. It certainly does not, Sandra flared. I wouldn't have him as a gift. No. Temple's tone was more than slightly skeptical. Fortunately, however, he doesn't want you. Your technique is all wrong. Coyness and mock modesty and stop or I'll scream and playing hard to get have no appeal whatever to his psychology. What he needs, has to have, is full, ungrudging cooperation. Aren't you taking a lot of risk in giving away such secrets? Not a bit. Try it. You are the sex-flaunting twins or Bev Bell or Stella the Henna. Any of you or all of you. I got there first with the most, and I'm not worried about competition. But suppose somebody tells him just how you're playing him for a sucker. Tell him anything you please. He's the first man I ever loved, or anywhere near, and I'm keeping him. You know, or do you, I wonder, what real, old-fashioned, honest-to-God love really is? The willingness, eagerness, both to give and to take? I can accept more from him and give him more in return than any other woman living, and I am going to. But does he love you? Sandra demanded. If he doesn't now, he will. I'll see to it that he does. But what do you want him for? You don't love him. You never did, and you never will. I don't want him, Sandra stamped a foot. I see. You just don't want me to have him. Okay, do your damnedest. But I've got work to do. This has been a lovely little cat-clawing, hasn't it? Let's have another one some day, and bring your friends. With a casual wave of her hand, Temple strolled away. And there flashed through Sandra's mind what Hilton had said so long ago, little more than a week out from Earth. And Temple Bells, of course, he had said. Don't fool yourself, chick. She's heavy artillery, and I mean heavy, believe me. So he had known all about Temple Bells all this time. Nevertheless, she took the first opportunity to get Hilton alone. And even before the first word, she forgot all about geodesic right lines and the full cooperation psychological approach. "'Aren't you the guy,' she demanded, who was laughing his head off at the idea that the board and its propiniquity would have any effect on him? Probably, more or less, what of it? This of it. You've fallen like a... a freshman for that... that... they should have christened her brazen bells. You're so right. I am? On what? The brazen. I told you she was a potent force, a full-scale powerhouse, in sync and on the line and I wasn't wrong. She's a damned female Ph.D., two or three times, and she knows all about slipsticks and isotopes, and she very definitely is not a cuddly little brunette. Remember? Sure. But what makes you think I'm in love with Temple Bells? What? Sandra tried to think of one bit of evidence, but could not. Why, why... She floundered, then came up with, Why... Everybody knows it. She says so herself. Did you ever hear her say it? Well, perhaps not in so many words. But she told me herself that you were going to be, and I know you are now. 
Your esper sense of endovics, no doubt. Hilton laughed, and Sandra went on furiously. She wouldn't keep on acting the way she does if there weren't something to it. What brilliant reasoning! Try again, Sandy. That's sheer sophistry, and you know it. It isn't, and I don't. And even if some day I should find myself in love with her, or with one or both of the twins, or Stella, or Beverly, or you, or Sylvia, for that matter, what would it prove? Just that I was wrong, and I admit freely that I was wrong in scoffing at the propiniquity. Wonderful stuff, that. You can see it working all over the ship, on me, even, in spite of my bragging. Without it, I'd never have known that you're a better, smarter operator than Eggie Eggleston ever was or ever can be. Partially mollified despite herself, and highly resentful of the fact, Sandra tried again. But don't you see, Jarve, that she's simply playing you for a sucker, pulling the strings and watching you dance? Since he was sure in his own mind that she was speaking the exact truth, it took everything he had to keep from showing any sign of how much that truth had hurt. However, he made the grade. "'If that thought does anything for you, Sandy,' he said steadily, "'keep right on thinking it. Thank God the field of thought is still free and open.' "'Oh, you—' Sandra gave up. She had shot her heaviest bolts. The last one, particularly, was so vicious that she had actually been afraid of what its consequences might be and they had not even dented Hilton's armor. She hadn't even found out that he had any feeling whatever for Temple Bells, except as a component of his smoothly functioning scientific machine. Nor did she learn any more as time went on. Temple continued to play flawlessly the part of being, if not exactly hopefully, at least not entirely hopelessly, in love with Jarvis Hilton. Her conduct, which at first caused some surprise, many conversations, one of which has been reported verbatim, and no little speculation, became comparatively unimportant as soon as it became evident that nothing would come of it. She apparently expected nothing. He was evidently not going to play footsie with, or show any favoritism whatever toward, any woman aboard the ship. Thus it was not surprising to anyone that, at an evening show, Temple sat beside Hilton, as close to him as she could get, and as far away as possible from everyone else. You can talk, can't you, Jarvis, without moving your lips and without anyone else hearing you? Of course, he replied, hiding his surprise. This was something completely new and completely unexpected, even from unpredictable temple bells. I want to apologize, to explain and to do anything I can to straighten out the mess I've made. It's true I joined the project because I've loved you for years. You have nothing to... Let me finish while I still have the courage. Only a slight tremor in her almost inaudible voice and the rigidity of the fists clenched in her lap betrayed the intensity of her emotion. I thought I could handle it. Damned fool that I was, I thought I could handle anything. I was sure I could handle myself under any possible conditions. I was going to put just enough into the act to keep any of these other harpies from getting their hooks into you. But everything got away from me. Out here, working with you every day knowing better every day what you are, well, that Rigoletto episode sunk me, and now I'm in a thousand feet over my head. I hug my pillow at night, dreaming it's you, and the fact that you don't and can't love me is driving me mad. I can't stand it any longer. There's only one thing to do. Fire me first thing in the morning and send me back to earth in a torp. You've plenty of grounds. Shut up. For seconds, Hilton had been trying to break into her hopeless monotone. Finally, he succeeded. The trouble with you is, you know altogether too damned much that isn't so. He was barely audible to keep his voice down and his eyes front. What do you think I'm made of? Super refract? I thought the whole performance was an act, to prove you're a better man than I am. You talk about dreams. Good God, you don't know what dreams are. If you say one more word about quitting, I'll show you whether I love you or not. I'll squeeze you so hard, I'll flatten you out flat. Two can play at that game, sweetheart. Her nostrils flared slightly, her fists clenched, if possible, a fraction tighter. 
and even in the distorted medium they were using for speech, she could not subdue completely her quick change into soaring, lifting buoyancy. While you're doing that, I'll see how strong your ribs are. Oh, how this changes things! I've never been half as happy in my whole life as I am right now. Maybe we can work it, if I can handle my end. Why, of course you can, and happy dreams are nice, not horrible. We'll make it, darling. Here's an imaginary kiss coming at you. Got it? Received in good order, thank you. Consumed with gusto and returned in kind. The show ended, and the two strolled out of the room. She walked no closer to him than usual, and no farther away from him. She did not touch him any oftener than she usually did, nor any whit more affectionately or possessively. And no watching eyes, not even the more than half-hostile eyes of Sandra Cummings or the sharply analytical eyes of Stella Wing, could detect any difference whatever in the relationship between worshipful adulatress and tolerantly understanding idol. The work, which had never moved at any very fast pace, went more and more slowly. Three weeks crawled past. Most of the crews and all of the teams except the first were working on side issues, tasks which, while important in and of themselves, had very little to do with the project's main problem. Hilton, even without Sandra's help, was all caught up. All the reports had been analyzed, correlated, cross-indexed, and filed, except those of the first team. Since he could not understand anything much beyond midpoint of the first tape, they were all reposing in a box labeled Pending. The Navy had torn fifteen of the Omen warships practically to pieces, installing Terran detectors and trying to learn how to operate Omen machinery and armament. In the former, they had succeeded very well. In the latter, not at all. Fifteen Omen ships were now out in deep space, patrolling the void in strict Navy style. Each was manned by two or three Navy men and several hundred Omens, each of whom was reveling in delight at being able to do a job for a master, even though that master was not present in person. Threat skeleton ships had been detected at long range, but the detections were inconclusive. The things had not changed course, or indicated in any other way that they had seen or detected the Omen vessels on patrol. If their detectors were no better than the Omens, they certainly hadn't. That idea, however, could not be assumed to be a fact, and the detections had becoming more and more frequent. Yesterday, a squadron of seven, the first time that anything except singles had appeared, had come much closer than any of the singles had ever done. Like all the others, however, these passers-by had not paid any detectable attention to anything omen. Hence it could be inferred that the skeletons posed no threat. But Sawtell was making no such inferences. He was very firmly of the opinion that the Strats were preparing for a massive attack. Hilton had assured Sawtell that no such attack could succeed, and Larry had told Sawtell why. Nevertheless, to keep the captain pacified, Hilton had given him permission to convert as many omen ships as he liked, to man them with as many omens as he liked, and to use ships and omens as he liked. Hilton was not worried about the Strets or the Navy. It was the first team. It was the bottleneck that was slowing everything down to a crawl, but they knew that. They knew it better than anyone else could, and felt it more keenly, especially Carnes, the team chief. He had been driving himself like a dog and showed it. Hilton had talked with him a few times, tried gently to make him take it easy. No soap. He'd have to hunt him up the next day or so and slug it out with him. He could do a lot better job on that if he had something to offer, something really constructive. That was a laugh, a very unfunny laugh. What could he, Jarvis Hilton, a specifically non-specialist director, do on such a job as that? Nevertheless, as director, he would have to do something to help Team One. If he couldn't do anything himself, it was up to him to juggle things around so that someone else could. End of chapter 5「Chapter 6 of Masters of Space by E. E. Doc Smith 
and E. Everett Evans. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Masters of Space Chapter 6 For one solid hour Hilton stared at the wall, motionless and silent. Then, shaking himself and stretching, he glanced at his clock. A little over an hour to supper time. They'd all be aboard. He talked this new idea over with Teddy Blake. He gathered up a few papers and was stapling them together when Carnes walked in. "'Hi, Bill. Speak of the devil. I was just thinking about you.' "'I'll just bet you were.' Carnes sat down, leaned over, and took a cigarette out of the box on the desk. "'And nothing printable, either.' "'Chip-chop, fellow, on that kind of noise,' Hilton said. The team chief looked actually haggard. Blue-black rings encircled both eyes. His powerful body slumped. "'How long has it been since you had a good night's sleep?' How long have I been on this job? Exactly one hundred and twenty days. I did get some sleep for the first few weeks, though. Yeah. So answer me one question. How much good will you do us after they've wrapped you up in one of those canvas affairs that lace up the back? Huh? Oh. But damn it, Jarve, I'm holding up the whole procession. Everybody on the project's just sitting around on their tookuses waiting for me to get something done, and I'm not doing it. I'm going so slow a snail is lightning in comparison. Calm down, big fellow. Don't rupture a gut or blow a gasket. I've talked to you before, but this time I'm going to smack you bow-legged. So stick out those big floppy ears of yours and really listen. Here are three words that I want you to pin up somewhere where you can see them all day long. Speed is relative. Look back. See how far up the hill you've come and then balance one hundred and twenty days against ten years. What? You mean you'll actually sit still for me holding everything up for ten years? You use the perpendicular pronoun too much and in the wrong place. On the hits it's we, but on the flops it's I. Quit it. Everything on this job is we. Tara's best brains are on Team One and are going to stay there. You will not. Repeat, not. Be interfered with, pushed around, or kicked around. You see, Bill, I know what you're up against. Yes, I guess you do. One of the damned few who do. But even if you personally are willing to give us ten years, how in hell do you think you can swing it? How about the Navy, the Strets, even the Board? They're my business, Bill, not yours. However, to give you a little boost, I'll tell you. With the Navy, I'll give them the fuel bin if I have to. The Omens have been taking care of the Strets for 2,700 centuries, so I'm not the least bit worried about their ability to keep on doing it for ten years more. And if the Board, or anybody else, sticks their runny little noses into Project Theta Orionis, I'll slap a quarantine onto both these solar systems that a microbe couldn't get through. You'd go that far? Why, you'd be... Do you think I wouldn't... Hilton snapped. Look at me, Junior. Eyes locked and held. Do you think, for one minute, that I'll let anybody on all of God's worlds pull me off this job or interfere with my handling of it unless and until I'm damned positively certain that we can't handle it? Carnes relaxed visibly. The lines of strain eased. Putting it in those words makes me feel better. I will sleep tonight and without any pills, either. Sure you will. One more thought. We all put in more than ten years getting our Terran educations, and an Omen education is a lot tougher. Really smiling for the first time in weeks, Carnes left the office, and Hilton glanced again at his clock. Pretty late now to see Teddy. Besides, he'd better not. She was probably keyed up about as high as Bill was, and in no shape to do the kind of thinking he wanted of her on this stuff. Better wait a couple of days. On the following morning, before breakfast, Theodora was waiting for him outside the mess hall. "'Good morning, Jarve,' she caroled. Reaching up, she took him by both ears, pulled his head down, and kissed him. As soon as he perceived her intent, he cooperated enthusiastically. "'What did you do to Bill?' Oh, you don't love me for myself alone, then, but just on account of that big jerk? That's right. 
Her artist model face, startlingly beautiful now, fairly glowed. Just then Temple Bell strolled up to them. "'Morning, you two lovely people!' She hugged Hilton's arm as usual. "'Shame on you, Teddy, but I wish I had the nerve to kiss him like that.' "'Nerve? You?' Teddy laughed as Hilton picked Temple up and kissed her in exactly the same fashion, he hoped, as he had just kissed Teddy. "'You've got more nerve than an aching tooth. But, as Jarve would say it, scat, kitten, we're having breakfast a la twosome. We've got things to talk about.' "'All right for you,' Temple said darkly, although her dazzling smile belied her tone. That first kiss, casually seeming as it had been, had carried vastly more freight than any observer could perceive. "'I'll hunt Bill up and make passes at him. See if I don't. That'll learn ya.' Theodora and Hilton did have their breakfast a due, but she did not realize until afterward that he had not answered her question as to what he had done to her bill. As has been said, Hilton had made it a prime factor of his job to become thoroughly well acquainted with every member of his staff. He had studied them en masse, in groups and singly. He had never, however, cornered Theodora Blake for individual study. Considering the power and quality of her mind, at the field which was her specialty, it had not been necessary. Thus it was with no ulterior motives at all that, three evenings later, he walked to her cubbyhole office and tossed the stapled papers onto her desk. "'Free for a couple of minutes, Teddy? I've got troubles.' "'I'll say you have.' Her lovely lips curled into an expression he had never before seen her wear, a veritable sneer. "'But these are not them.' She tossed the papers into a drawer and stuck out her chin. Her face turned as hard as such a beautiful face could. Her eyes dug steadily into his. Hilton inwardly flinched. His mind flashed backward. She too had been working under stress, of course, but that wasn't enough. What could he have possibly done to put Teddy Blake, of all people, onto such a warpath as this? I've been wondering when you were going to try to put me through your ringer, she went on in the same cold, hard voice. And I've been waiting to tell you something. You have wrapped all the other women around your fingers like so many rings, and what a sickening exhibition that has been. But you are not going to make either a ring or a lapdog out of me. Almost, but not quite too late, Hilton saw through that perfect act. He seized her right hand in both of his, held it up over her head, and waved it back and forth in the sign of victory. "'Socked me with my own club!' he exulted, laughing delightedly, boyishly. "'And came within a tenth of a split red hair. If it hadn't been so absolutely out of character, you'd have got away with it. What a load of stuff! I was right. Of all the women on this project, you're the only one I've ever been really afraid of.' "'Oh, damn! Ouch!' She grinned ruefully. I hit you with everything I had, and it just bounced. You're an operator, Chief. Hit em hard at completely unexpected angles. Keep em staggering, completely off balance. Tell em nothing. Let em deduce your lies for themselves. And if anybody tries to slug you back, like I did just now, duck it and clobber him in another unprotected spot. Watching you work has been not only a delight— but also a liberal education. Thanks. I love you too, Teddy. He lighted two cigarettes, handed her one. I'm glad, though, to lay it flat on the table with you, because in any battle of wits with you, I'm licked before we start. Yeah, you just proved it. And after licking me hands down, you think you can square it by swinging the old shovel that way? She did not quite know whether to feel resentful or not. Think over a couple of things. First, with the possible exception of Temple Bells, you're the best brain aboard. No, you are. Then Temple. Then there are... Hold it. You know as well as I do that accurate self-judgment is impossible. Second, the jam we're in. Do I, or don't I, want to lay it on the table with you, now and from here on? Bore into that with your Class A double-prime brain. Then tell me. He leaned back, half closed his eyes and smoked lazily. She stiffened, narrowed her eyes in concentration, and thought. Finally, 
Yes, you do. And I'm gladder of that than you will ever know. I think I know already, since you're her best friend and the only other woman I know of in her class. But I came in to kick a couple of things around with you. As you've noticed, that's getting to be my favorite indoor sport. Probably because I'm a sort of jackleg theoretician myself. You can frame that, Jarve, as the understatement of the century. But first, you are going to answer that question you sidestepped so neatly. What I did to Bill? I finally convinced him that nobody expected the team to do that big a job overnight, that you could have ten years, or more if necessary. I see, she frowned, but you and I both know that we can't string it out that long. He did not answer immediately. We could, but we probably won't, unless we have to. We should know, long before that, whether we'll have to switch to some other line of attack. You've considered the possibilities, of course. Have you got anything in shape to do a fine-tooth on? Not yet. That is, except for the ultimate, which is too ghastly to even consider, except as an ultimately last resort. Have you? I know what you mean. No, I haven't either. You don't think, then, that we had better do any collaborative thinking yet? Definitely not. There's altogether too much danger of setting both our lines of thought into one dead-end channel. Check. The other thing I wanted from you is your considered opinion as to my job on the organization as a whole. And don't pull your punches. Are we in good shape or not? What can I do to improve the setup? I have already considered that very thing, at great length. And honestly, Jarve, I don't see how it can be improved in any respect. You've done a marvelous job. Much better than I thought possible at first. He heaved a deep sigh of relief, and she went on. This could very easily have become a god-awful mess. But the board knew what they were doing, especially as to top man, so there are only about four people aboard who realize what you have done. Alex Kincaid and Sandra Cummings are two of them. One of the three girls is very deeply and very truly in love with you. Ordinarily, I'd say no comment, but we're laying on the line, well... You'll lay that on the line only if I corkscrew it out of you, so I'll QED it. You probably know that when Sandy gets done playing around, it'll be bounce back, Teddy. She isn't, hasn't been. If anything, too much the opposite. A dedicated scientist type. She smiled, a highly cryptic smile. For a man as brilliant and as penetrant in every other respect, but, after all, if the big dope didn't realize that half the women aboard, including Sandy, had been making passes at him, she certainly wouldn't enlighten him. Besides, that one particular area of obtuseness was a real part of his charm. Wherefore, she said merely, I'm not sure whether I'm a bit catty or you're a bit stupid. Anyway, it's Alex she's really in love with, and you already know about Bill and me. Of course, he's tops one of the world's very finest. You're in the same bracket, and as a couple, you're a dry fit. One in a million. Now I can say, I love you too. She paused for half a minute, then stubbed out her cigarette and shrugged. Now I'm going to stick my neck way, way out. You can knock it off if you like. She's a tremendous lot of woman, and if, well, strong as she is, it'd shatter her to bits. So, I'd like to ask, I don't quite... Well, is she going to get hurt? Have I managed to hide it that well, from you? It was her turn to show relief. Perfectly, even, or especially, that time you kissed her. So damned perfectly that I've been scared green. I've been waking myself up screaming in the middle of the night. You couldn't let on, of course. And that's the hell of such a job as yours. The rest of us can smooch around all over the place. I knew the question was extremely improper. Thanks a million for answering it. I haven't started to answer it yet. I said I'd lay everything on the line, so here it is. Saying she's a tremendous lot of woman is like calling the Perseus a nice little baby's bathtub toy boat. I'd go to hell for her any time, cheerfully, standing straight up, wading into brimstone and lava up to the eyeballs. 
If anything ever hurts her, it'll be because I'm not man enough to block it. And just the minute this damn job is over, or even sooner, if enough of you couples make it so I can, Jarvis, she shrieked, jumping up. She kissed him enthusiastically. That's just wonderful. He thought it was pretty wonderful, too, and after ten minutes more of conversation, he got up and turned toward the door. I feel a lot better, Teddy. Thanks for being such a nice pressure relief valve. Would you mind it too much if I come in and sob on your bosom again some day? I'd love it, she laughed, then, as he again started to leave. Wait a minute. I'm thinking. It'd be more fun to sob on her bosom. You haven't even kissed her yet, have you? I mean, really kissed her. You know I haven't. She's the one person aboard I can't be alone with for a second. True. But I know of one chaperone who could become deaf and blind, she said with a broad and happy grin. On my door, you know, there's a huge invisible sign that says to everyone except you, Stop! Brain at work! Silence! And if I were properly approached and sufficiently urged, I might... I just conceivably might. Consider it done, you little sweetheart, up to and including my most vigorous and most insidious attempts at seduction. Done. Maneuver your big husky carcass around here behind the desk so the door can open. She flipped a switch and punched a number. I can call anybody in here any time, you know. Hello, dear, this is Teddy. Can you come in for just a few minutes? Thanks. And one minute later, there came a light tap on the door. Come in, Teddy called, and Temple Bells entered the room. She showed no surprise at seeing Hilton. Hi, Chief, she said. It must be something both big and tough to have you and Teddy both on it. You're so right. It was very big and very tough. But it's solved, darling. So, darling, she gasped almost inaudibly, both hands flying to her throat. Her eyes flashed toward the other woman. Teddy knows all about us, accessory before, during, and after the fact. Darling! This time the word was a shriek. She extended both arms and started forward. Hilton did not bother to maneuver his big husky carcass around the desk, but simply hurtled it straight toward her. Temple Bells was a tall, lithe, strong woman and all the power of her arms and torso went into the ensuing effort to crack Hilton's ribs. Those ribs, however, were highly capable structural members, and furthermore they were protected by thick slabs of hard, hard muscle. And fortunately he was not trying to fracture her ribs. His pressures were distributed much more widely. He was, according to promise, doing his very best to flatten her whole resilient body out flat and as they stood there, locked together in sheerest ecstasy, Theodora Blake began openly and unashamedly to cry. It was Temple who first came up for air. She wriggled loose from one of his arms, felt of her hair, and gazed unseeingly into her mirror. "'That was wonderful, sweetheart,' she said then, shakily. "'And I can never thank you enough, Teddy. But we can't do this very often, can we?' The addendum fairly begged for contradiction. "'Not too often, I'm afraid,' Hilton said, and Theodora agreed. "'Well,' the man said somewhat later, "'I'll leave you two ladies to do your knitting or whatever. After a couple of short ones for the road, that is.' "'Not looking like that,' Teddy said sharply. "'Hold still, and we'll clean you up.' Then, as both girls went to work, if anybody ever sees you coming out of this office looking like that, she went on darkly, and Bill finds out about it, he'll think it's my lipstick smeared all over you, and I'll strangle you to death with my bare hands. And that was supposed to be kiss-proof lipstick, too, Temple said seriously, although her whole face glowed and her eyes danced. You know, I'll never believe another advertisement I read. Oh, I wouldn't go so far as to say that if I were you. Teddy's voice was gravity itself, although she, too, was bubbling over. It probably is kiss-proof. I don't think kissing is quite the word for the performance you just staged. To stand up under such punishment as you gave it, my dear, 
anything would have to be tattooed in, not just put on. Hey, Hilton protested, you promised to be deaf and blind. I did no such thing. I said could, not would. Why, I wouldn't have missed that for anything. When Hilton left the room, he was apparently, in every respect, his usual self-contained self. However, it was not until the following morning that he so much as thought of the sheaf of papers lying unread in the drawer of Theodora Blake's desk. End of chapter 6「Masters of Space」by E. E. Doc Smith and E. Everett Evans. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Masters of Space Chapter 7 Knowing that he had done everything he could to help the most important investigations get under way, Hilton turned his attention to secondary matters. He made arrangements to decondition Javo, the number two omen boss whereupon that worthy became Javi and promptly bumped the omen who had been shadowing Carnes. Larry and Javi, working nights, deconditioned all the other omens having any contact with Wusai personnel. Then they went on to set up a routine for deconditioning all omens on both planets. Assured at last that the omens would thenceforth work with and really serve human beings, instead of insisting upon doing their work for them, Hilton knew that the time had come to let all his Busai personnel move into their homes aground. Everyone, including himself, was fed up to the gozzle with spaceship life, its jam-packed crowding, its flat, reprocessed air, its limited variety of uninteresting food. Conditions were especially irksome, since everybody knew that there was available to all, whenever Hilton gave the word, a whole city full of all the room anyone could want natural fresh air and, so the omens had told them, an unlimited choice of everything anyone wanted to eat. Nevertheless, the decision was not an easy one to make. Living conditions were admittedly not good on the ship. On the other hand, with almost no chance at all of solitude, the few people who had private offices aboard were not the ones he worried about, there was no danger of sexual trouble. Strictly speaking, he was not responsible for the morals of his force. He knew that he was being terribly old-fashioned. Nevertheless, he could not argue himself out of the conviction that he was morally responsible. Finally, he took the thing up with Sandra, who merely laughed at him. "'How long have you been worrying about that, Jarve?' "'Ever since I okayed moving aground the first time. That was one reason I was so glad to cancel it then.' You were slightly unclear, a little rattled. But which factor, the fun and games, which is the moral issue, or the consequences? The consequences, he admitted with a rueful grin. I don't give a hoop how much fun they have, but you know as well as I do just how prudish public sentiment is, and Project Theta Orionis is squarely in the middle of the public eye. You should have checked with me sooner and saved yourself wear and tear. There's no danger at all of consequences, except weddings. Lots of weddings, and fast. Weddings and babies wouldn't bother me a bit, nor interfere with the job too much, with the omens as nurses. But why the fast, if you aren't anticipating any shotgun weddings? Female psychology, she replied with a grin. Aboard ship here, there's no home atmosphere whatever, nothing but work, work, work. Put a woman into a house, though, especially such houses as the omens have built and with such servants as they insist on being, and she goes domestic in a really big way. Just sex isn't good enough any more. She wants the kind of love that goes with a husband and a home, and nine times out of ten, she gets it. With these Busai women, it'll be ten out of ten. You may be right, of course, but it sounds kind of far-fetched to me. "'Wait and see, chum,' Sandra said with a laugh. Hilton made his announcement, and everyone moved aground the next day. No one, however, had elected to live alone. Almost everyone had chosen to double up, the most noteworthy exceptions being twelve laboratory girls who had decided to keep on living together. However, they now had a twenty-room house instead of a one-room dormitory to live in, 
and a staff of twenty omen girls to help them do it. Hilton had suggested that Temple and Teddy, whose house was only a hundred yards or so from the Hilton Carnes bungalow, should have supper and spend the first evening with them, but the girls had knocked that idea flat. Much better, they thought, to let things ride as nearly as possible exactly as they had aboard the Perseus. A little smooching now and then, on the cue strictly tea, but that's all, darling, that's positively all," Temple had said, after a highly satisfactory ten minutes alone with him in her own gloriously private room, and that was the way it had to be. Hence it was a stag inspection that Hilton and Carnes made of their new home. It was very long, very wide, and for its size, very low. Four of its five rooms were merely adjuncts to its tremendous living room. There was a huge fireplace at each end of this room, in each of which a fire of four-foot-long fir cordwood crackled and snapped. There was a great hi-fi tri with over a hundred tapes, all new. "'Yes, sirs,' Larry and Jabby spoke in unison. "'The players and singers who entertained the masters of old have gone back to work. They will also, of course, appear in person whenever and wherever you wish. Both men looked around the vast room, and Carn said, All the comforts of home and a couple of bucks worth besides. Wall-to-wall -wall carpeting an inch and a half thick, a grand piano, easy chairs and loafers and davenports, very fine reproductions of our favorite paintings, and statuary. You said it, brother. Hilton was bending over a group in bronze. If I didn't know better, I'd swear this is the original De Haven Dance of the Nymphs. Carnes had marched up too and was examining minutely a two-by-three-foot painting, in a heavy gold frame, of a gorgeously auburn-haired nude. Reproduction, hell! This is a duplicate! Lawrence's Innocent is worth twenty million wogs, and it's sealed behind quad armor-glass in prime art. But I'll bet wogs de Wiggles, the prime curator himself, with all his apparatus, couldn't tell this one from his. I wouldn't take even one Wigglesworth of that. And this laughing cavalier and this Toledo are twice as old and twice as fabulously valuable. And there are my own golf clubs. Excuse us, sirs, the omen said. These things were simple because they could be induced in your minds. But the matter of a staff could not, nor what you would like to eat for supper, and it is growing late. Staff? What the hell has the staff got to do with— How staff, they mean, Carn said. We don't need much of anybody, boys. Somebody to keep the place ship-shape is all. Or as a deluxe touch, how about a waitress? One housekeeper and one waitress. That'll be finer. Very well, sirs. There is one other matter. It has troubled us that we have not been able to read in your minds the logical datum that they should, in fact, simulate Dr. Bells and Dr. Blake— Huh? Both men gasped, and then both exploded like one twelve-inch length of primacord. While the omens could not understand this purely Terran reasoning, they accepted the decision without a demurring thought. Who, then, are the two it's to simulate? No stipulation. Roll your own, Hilton said, and glanced at Carnes. None of these omen women are really hard on the eyes. Check. Anybody who wouldn't call any one of them a slurpy dish needs a new set of optic nerves. In that case, the omen said, no delay at all will be necessary, as we can make do with one temporarily. The Sori, no longer Sora, who has not been glad since the Thule replaced it, is now in your kitchen. It comes. A woman came in and stood quietly in front of the two men, the wafted air carrying from her clear, smooth skin a faint but unmistakable fragrance of Idaho Mountain Syringa. She was radiantly happy. Her bright, deep green eyes went from man to man. "'You wish, sirs, to give me your orders verbally. And yes, you may order fresh, whole, not canned hen's eggs.' "'I certainly will, then. I haven't had a fried egg since we left Terra.' "'But—' Larry said, "'You aren't sorry.' "'Oh, but I am, sir.' Carnes had been staring at her, eyes popping. "'Holy St. Patrick! Talk about simulation, Jarve! They've made her over into Lawrence's innocent, exact at twenty decimals!' "'You're so right!' 
Hilton's eyes went, half a dozen times, from the form of flesh to the painting and back. That must have been a terrific job. Oh, no, it was quite simple, really, Sorry said. Since the brain was not involved, I merely reddened my hair and lengthened it, made my eyes to be green, changed my face a little, pulled myself in a little round here. Her beautifully manicured hands swept the full circle of her waistline, then continued to demonstrate appropriately the rest of her speech. And pushed me out a little up here, and tapered my legs a little more, made them a little larger and rounder here at my hips and thighs and a little smaller toward and at my ankles. Oh, yes, and made my feet and hands a little smaller. That's all. I thought that Dr. Carnes would like me a little better this way. You can broadcast that over the PA system at high noon. Carnes was still staring. That's all, she says. But you didn't have time to. Oh, I did a day before yesterday. As soon as Javi materialized the innocent, and I knew it to be your favorite art. But damn it, we hadn't even thought of having you here then. But I had, sir. I fully intended to serve, one way or another, in this your home. But, of course, I had no idea I would ever have such an honor as actually waiting on you at your table. Will you please give me your orders, sirs, besides the eggs? You wish the eggs fried in butter, three of them apiece, and sunny side up. Uh-huh, with ham, Pilton said. I'll start with a jumbo shrimp cocktail, horseradish and ketchup sauce, heavy on the horseradish. Same for me, Carn said, but only half as much horseradish. And for the rest of it, Pilton went on, hash brown potatoes and buttered toast, plenty of extra butter, strong coffee from first to last, whipping cream and sugar on the side. For dessert, apple pie a la mode. You make me drool, chief. Play that for me, please, innocent, all the way. Oh, you are, you personally yourself, sir, renaming me innocent? If he'll sit still for it, yes. That is an incredible honor, sir. Simply unbelievable. I thank you, I thank you. Radiating happiness, she dashed away toward the kitchen. When the two men were full of food, they strolled over to a davenport facing the fire. As they sat down, Innocent entered the room, carrying a tall, dewy-knit julep on a tray. She was followed by another female figure bearing a bottle of Avignognac, and the appurtenances which are its due, and at the first full sight of that figure Hilton stopped breathing for fifteen seconds. Her hair was very thick, intensely black and long, cut squarely off just below the lowest parts of her shoulder blades. Heavy brows and long lashes, eyes too were all intensely, vividly black. Her skin was tanned to a deep and glowing, almost but not quite brown. "'Murchison's dark lady!' Hilton gasped. "'Larry, you've—we've—I've got that painting here?' "'Oh, yes, sir.' The newcomer spoke before Larry could. "'At the other end, your part of the room. You will look now, sir, please?' Her voice was low, rich, and as smooth as cream. Putting her tray down carefully on the end table, she led them toward the other fireplace, past the piano, past the tri pit, past a towering grillwork holding art treasures by the score. Over to the left, against the wall, there was a big, business-like desk. On the wall, over the desk, hung the painting, a copy of which had been in Hilton's room for over eight years. He stared at it for at least a minute. He glanced around, at the other priceless duplicates so prodigally present, at his own guns arrayed above the mantel and on each side of the fireplace. Then, without a word, he started back to join Carnes. She walked springily beside him. "'What's your name, miss?' he asked finally. "'I haven't earned any as yet, sir. My number is—never mind that. Your name is Dark Lady.' Oh, thank you, sir, that is truly wonderful. And Dark Lady sat cross-legged on the rug at Hilton's feet and busied herself with the esoteric rites of old Avignon. Hilton took a deep inhalation and a small sip, then stared at Carnes. Carnes, over the rim of his glass, stared back. I can see where this would be habit-forming, Hilton said, and very deadly, extremely deadly. Every wish granted. 
surrounded by all this. Carn swept his arm through three quarters of a circle. Waited on hand and foot by powerful men and by the materializations of the dreams of the greatest, finest artist who ever lived. Fatal? I don't know. My solid hope is that we never have to find out. And when you add in innocent and dark lady, they look to be about seventeen, but the thought that they're older than the hills of Rome and powered by everlasting atomic engines. He broke off suddenly and blushed. Excuse me, please, girls. I know better than to talk about people that way, right in front of them. I really do. Do you really think we're people? Innocent and dark lady squealed as one. That set Hilton back onto his heels. I don't know. I've wondered. Are you? Both girls, silent, looked at Larry. We don't know either, Larry said. At first, of course, there were crude, non-thinking machines. But when the guide attained its present status, the masters themselves could not agree. They divided about half and half on the point. They never did settle it any closer than that. I certainly won't try to, then. But for my money, you are people, Hilton said, and Carnes agreed. That, of course, touched off a new riot of joy, after which the two men made an inch-by-inch -inch study of their tremendous living room. Then, long after bedtime, Larry and Dark Lady escorted Hilton to his bedroom. "'Do you mind, sir, if we sleep on the floor at the sides of your bed?' Larry asked. "'Or must we go out into the hall?' "'Sleep? I didn't know you could sleep. "'It is not essential. However, when round-the-clock work is not necessary, and we have opportunity to sleep near a human being, we derive a great deal of pleasure and satisfaction from it. You see, sir, we also serve during sleep. Okay, I'll try anything once. Sleep wherever you please. Hilton began to peel, but before he had his shirt off, both Larry and Dark Lady were stretched out flat, sound asleep, one almost under each edge of his bed. He slid in between the sheets, it was the most comfortable bed he had ever slept in, and went to sleep as though sandbagged. He had time to wonder, foggily, whether the omens were in fact helping him to go to sleep, and then he was asleep. A month passed. Eight couples had married, the Navy chaplain officiating, in the Perseus, of course, since the warship was, always and everywhere, an integral part of Terra. Sandra had dropped in one evening to see Hilton about a bit of business. She was now sitting, long dancer's legs outstretched toward the fire, with a cigarette in her left hand and a tall, cold drink on a coaster at her right. "'This is a wonderful room, Jarvis. It'd be perfect if it weren't quite so... so mannish.' "'What do you expect of a bachelor's hall? A boudoir? Don't tell me you're going domestic, Sandy, just because you've got a house.' Not just that, no. But, of course, it helped it along. Alex is a mighty good man, one of the finest I have ever known. She eyed him for a moment in silence. Jarvis Hilton, you are one of the keenest, most intelligent men who ever lived. And yet... She broke off and studied him for a good half-minute. Say, if I let my hair clear down, will you... Scout's oath. That, and yet, requires elucidation at any cost. I know. But first, yes, it's Alex. I never would have believed that any man ever born could hit me so hard. Soon. I didn't want to be the first, but I won't be anywhere near the last. But tell me, you were really in love with Temple, weren't you, when I asked you? Yes. Ha! You are letting your hair down. That makes me feel better. Huh? Why should it? It elucidates the and yet no end. You were insulated from all other female charms by ye brazen bells. You see, most of us assistants made a kind of game out of seeing which of us could make you break the executive's code. And none of us made it. Teddy and Temple said you didn't know what was going on. Bev and I said nobody as smart as you are could possibly be that stupid. You aren't the type to leak or name names. Oh, I see. You are merely reporting a conversation. The game had interested, but non-participating observers. Temple and Teddy, at least. 
At least, she agreed. But damn it, you aren't stupid. There isn't a stupid bone in your head. So it must be love. And if so, what about marriage? Why don't you and Temple make it a double with Alex and me? That's the most cogent thought you ever had. But setting the date is the bride's business. He glanced at his omen wristwatch. It's early yet. Let's skip over. I wouldn't mind seeing her a minute or two. Thy statement ringeth with truth, friend. Bill's there with Teddy? I imagine so. So we'll talk to them about making it a triple. Oh, nice. Let's go. They left the house, and, her hand tucked under his elbow, walked up the street. Next morning, on her way to the Hall of Records, Sandra stopped off as usual at the office. The omens were all standing motionless. Hilton was leaning far back in his chair, feet on desk, hands clasped behind head, eyes closed. Knowing what that meant, she turned and started back out on tiptoe. However, he had heard her. "'Can you spare a couple of minutes to think at me, Sandy?' "'Minutes or hours, Chief.' Tooley placed a chair for her, and she sat down, facing him across his desk. "'Thanks, gal. This time it's the Strets. Sawtell's been having nightmares, you know, ever since we emerged, about being attacked, and I've been poo-pooing the idea. But now it's a statistic that the soup is getting thicker, and I can't figure out why. Why in all the hells of space should a stasis that has lasted for over a quarter of a million years be broken at this exact time? The only possible explanation is that we caused the break. And any way I look at that concept, it's plain idiocy. Both were silent for minutes, and then it was demonstrated again that Terra's advisory board had done better than it knew in choosing Sandra Cummings to be Jarvis Hilton's working mate. "'We did cause it, Jarve,' she said finally. "'They knew we were coming, even before we got to Fuel Bin. They knew we were human and tried to wipe out the omens before we got there. Preventive warfare, you know.' "'They couldn't have known,' he snorted. Strat detectors are no better than Omen, and you know what Sam Bryant had to say about them. I know, Sandra grinned appreciatively. It's becoming a classic. But it couldn't have been any other way. Besides, I know they did. He stared at her helplessly, then swung on Larry. Does that make sense to you? Yes, sir. The Strats could pay on Dyer as well as the old masters could, and they undoubtedly still can and do. Okay, it does make sense, then. He absented himself in thought, then came to life with a snap. Okay, the next thing on the agenda is a crash priority try at a Payondex team. Tuli, you organize a team to generate Sathra. Can you do the same for Payondex? If we can find the ingredients, yes, sir. I had a hunch. Larry, please ask Teddy Blake's omen to bring her in here. I'll be running along, then. Sandra started to get up. "'I hope to kiss a green pig you won't,' Hilton snapped. "'You're one of the biggest wheels. Larry, we'll want Temple Bells and Beverly Bell for a start.' "'Chief, you positively amaze me,' Sandra said then. "'Every time you get one of these attacks of genius, or whatever it is, you have me gasping like a fish. Just what can you possibly want of Bev Bell?' whatever it was that enabled her to hit the target against odds of almost infinity to one, not just once, but time after time. By definition, intuition. What quality did you use just now in getting me off the hook? Intuition. What makes Teddy Blake such an unerring performer? Intuition again. My hunches? They're intuition, too. Intuition, hell. Labels based on utterly abysmal damned dumb ignorance of our own basic frames of reference. Do you think those four kinds of intuition are alike, by seven thousand rows of apple trees? Of course not. I see what you're getting at. Oh, this'll be fun! The others came in, and one by one, Tooley examined each of the four women and the man. Each felt the probing, questioning feelers of her thought prying into the deepest recesses of his mind. There is not quite enough of each of the three components, all of which are usually associated with the male. You, sir, have much of each, but not enough. 
I know your men quite well, and I think we will need the doctor's Kincaid and Carnes and Pointer. But such deep probing is felt. Have I permission, sir? Yes. Tell him I said so. Tooley scanned. Yes, sir. We should have all three. Get em, Larry. Then, in the pause that followed, Sandy, remember yowling about too many sweeties on a team? What do you think of this business of all sweeties? All that proves is that nobody can be wrong all the time, she replied flippantly. The three men arrived and were instructed. Tooley said, The great trouble is that each of you must use a portion of your mind that you do not know you have. You this one, you that one. Tooley probed mercilessly, so poignantly that each in turn flinched under brand new and almost unbearable pain. With you, Dr. Hilton, it will be by far the worst, for you must learn to use almost all the portions of both your minds, the conscious and the unconscious. This must be, because you are the actual peyondixer. The others merely supply energies in which you yourself are deficient. Are you ready for a terrible shock, sir? Shoot. He thought for a second that he had been shot, that his brain had blown up. He couldn't stand it. He knew he was going to die. He wished he could die. Anything, anything whatever, to end this unbearable agony. It ended. Writhing, white and sweating, Hilton opened his eyes. Ouch! he remarked conversationally. What next? You will seize hold of the energies your friends offer. You will bind them to yours and shape the whole into a dimensionless sphere of pure, controlled, dirigible energy. And, as well as being the binding force, the cohesiveness, you must also be the captain and the pilot and the astrogator and the ultimately complex computer itself. But how can I... Okay, damn it, I will. Of course you will, sir. Remember also that once the joinings are made, I can be of very little more assistance, for my peyondix is nothing compared to that of your fusion of eight. Now, to assemble the energies and join them, you will, altogether, deny the existence of the sum total of reality as you know it. Distance does not exist. Every point in the reachable universe coincides with every other point, and that common point is the focus of your attention. You can be, and actually are, anywhere you please or everywhere at once. Time does not exist. Space does not exist. There is no such thing as opacity. Everything is perfectly transparent. Yet every molecule of substance is perceptible in its relationship to every other molecule in the cosmos. Senses do not exist. Sight, hearing, taste, touch, smell, sathura, endovix, all are parts of one great sense of peyondix. I am guiding each of you seven. Closer. Tighter. There. Seize it, sir. And when you work the struts, you must fix it clearly that time does not exist. You must work in millionths of microseconds instead of in minutes, for they have minds of tremendous power. Reality does not exist. Compress it more, sir. Tighter. Smaller rounder. There, hold it. Reality does not exist. Distance does not exist. All possible points are wonderful. Tooley screamed the word and the thought, Goodbye! Good luck! End of chapter 7「Chapter 8 of Masters of Space by E. E. Doc Smith and E. Everett Evans. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Masters of Space, Chapter 8 Hilton did not have to drive the peyondix beam to the planet Strett. It was already there. And there was the monstrous First Lord Thinker, Zoyar. Into that mind his multi-mind flashed. It's every member as responsive to his will as his own fingers— almost infinitely more so, in fact, because of the tremendous lengths of time required to send messages along nerves. That horrid mind was scanned cell by cell. Then, after what seemed like a few hours, when a shield began sluggishly to form, 
Hilton transferred his probe to the mind of the second thinker, one Lord Inos, and absorbed everything she knew. Then, the minds of all the other thinkers being screened, he studied the whole Strat planet, foot by foot, and everything that was on it. Then, mission accomplished, Hilton snapped his attention back to his office and the multi-mind fell apart. As he opened his eyes, he heard Tuli scream, Luck! Oh, you still here, Tuli? How long have we been gone? Approximately one and one-tenth seconds, sir. What? Beverly Bell, in the haven of Franklin Pointer's arms, fainted quietly. Sandra shrieked piercingly. The four men stared, goggle-eyed. Temple and Teddy, as though by common thought, burrowed their faces into brawny shoulders. Hilton recovered first. So that's what Payondix is. Yes, sir. I mean, no, sir. No, I mean, yes, but— Tuli paused, licking her lips in that peculiarly human female gesture of uncertainty. Well, what do you mean? It either is or isn't. Or is that necessarily so? Not exactly, sir. That is, started as Payondix, but it became something else. Not even the most powerful mind of the old masters, nobody, ever did or ever could possibly generate such a force as that, or handle it so fast. Well, with seven of the best minds of Terra and a— Chip-chop the chit-chat, Karn said harshly. What I want to know is whether I was having a nightmare. Can there possibly be a race such as I thought I saw? So utterly savage, ruthless, merciless. So devoid of every human trace and so hell-bent determined on the extermination of every other race in the galaxy? God damn it, it simply doesn't make sense. Eyes went from eyes to eyes to eyes. All had seen the same indescribably horrible, abysmally atrocious things qualities and quantities and urges and drives that no words in any language could even begin to portray. It doesn't seem to, but there it is. Teddy Blake shook her head hopelessly. Big Bill Carnes, hands still shaking, lit a cigarette before he spoke again. Well, I've never been a proponent of genocide, but it's my considered opinion that the Strats are one race the galaxy can get along without. A hell of a lot better without, Pointer said, and all agreed. The point is, what can we do about it? Kincaid asked. The first thing I would say is to see whether we can do this, whatever it is, without Tuli's help. Shall we try it? Although I, for one, don't feel like doing it right away. Not I either. Beverly Bell held up her right hand, which was shaking uncontrollably. I feel as though I've been bucking waves, wind, and tide for forty-eight straight hours, without food, water, or touch. Maybe in about a week I'll be ready for another try at it, but today, not a chance. Okay, scat, all of you, Hilton ordered. Take the rest of the day off and rest up. Put on your thought screens, and don't take them off for a second from now on. Those strats are tough hombres. Sandra was the last to leave. And you, boss? she asked pointedly. I've got some thinking to do. I'll stay and help you think? Not yet. He shook his head, frowned, and then grinned. You see, Chick, I don't even know yet what it is I'm going to have to think about. A bit unclear, but I know what you mean, I think. Luck, Chief. In their subterranean sanctum turn on distant Strett, Two of the deepest thinkers of that horribly unhuman race were in coldly intent conference via thought. "'My mind has been plundered, Inos,' First Lord Thinker Zoyar radiated harshly. "'Despite the extremely high reactivity of my shield, some information, I do not know how much, was taken. The operator was one of the humans of that ship. I, too, felt a plucking at my mind. But those humans could not pay on dire, First Lord.' Be logical, fool! At that contact, in the matter of which you erred in not following up continuously, they succeeded in concealing their real abilities from you. That could be the truth. Our ancestors erred, then, in recording that all those weak and timid humans had been slain. These offenders are probably their descendants, 
returning to reclaim their former world. The probability must be evaluated and considered. Was it, or was it not, through human aid, that the omens destroyed most of our task force? Highly probable, but impossible of evaluation with the data now available. Obtain more data at once. That point must be and shall be fully evaluated and fully considered. This entire situation is intolerable. It must be abated. True, First Lord, but every operator and operation is now tightly screened. Oh, if I could only go out there myself. Hold, fool! Your thought is completely disloyal and unstretly. True, O oh First Lord Thinker Zoyar, I will forthwith remove my unworthy self from this place of existence. You will not. I hereby abolish that custom. Our numbers are too few by far. Too many have failed to adapt. Also, as second thinker, your death at this time would be slightly detrimental to certain matters now in work. I will myself, however, slay the unfit. To that end, repeat the words under my paendiring. I am a Strett. I will devote my every iota of mental and of physical strength to forwarding the great plan, I am and will remain a Strett. You do believe in the words? Of course I believe in them. I know that in a few more hundreds of thousands of years we will be rid of material bodies and will become invincible and invulnerable. Then comes the conquest of the galaxy, and then the conquest of the universe. No more, then, on your life of this weak and cowardly repining. Now, what of your constructive thinking? Programming must be such as to obviate time lag. We must evaluate the factors already mentioned and many others, such as the reactivation of the spacecraft which was thought to have been destroyed so long ago. After having considered all these evaluations, I will construct a minor plan to destroy these omens, whom we have permitted to exist on sufferance, and with them that shipload of despicably interloping humans. That is well. Zoyar's mind seethed with a malevolent ferocity starkly impossible for any human mind to grasp. And to that end? To that end, we must intensify still more our program of procuring data. We must revise our mechs in the light of every technological advance during the many thousands of cycles since the last such revision was made. Our every instrument of power, of offense and of defense, must be brought up to the theoretical ultimate of capability. And as to the great brain? I have been able to think of nothing, First Lord, to add to the undertakings you have already set forth. It was not expected that you would. Now, is it your final thought that these interlopers are in fact the descendants of those despised humans of so long ago? It is. It is also mine. I return then to my work upon the brain. You will take whatever measures are necessary. Use every artifice of intellect and of ingenuity and our every resource. But abate this intolerable nuisance, and soon. It shall be done first, Lord. The second thinker issued orders. Frenzied, round-the-clock activity ensued. Hundreds of mechs operated upon the brains of hundreds of others, who in turn operated upon the operators. Then all those brains charged with the technological advances of many thousands of years. The combined hundreds went unrestingly to work. Thousands of work mechs were built and put to work at the construction of larger and more powerful spacecraft. As has been implied, those battle skeletons of the Strets were controlled by their own built-in mechanical brains, which were programmed for only the simplest of battle maneuvers. Anything at all out of the ordinary had to be handled by remote control, by the specialist mechs at their two miles long control board. This was now to be changed. Programming was to be made so complete that almost any situation could be handled by the warship or the missile itself instantly. The Strets knew that they were the most powerful, the most highly advanced race in the universe. Their science was the highest in the universe. Hence, with every operating unit brought up to the full possibilities of that science, that would be more than enough. Period. This work, 
while it required much time, was very much simpler than the task which the first thinker had laid out for himself on the giant computer plus which the Strets called the Great Brain. In stating his project, first Lord Zoyar had said, Assignment to construct a machine that will have the following abilities. 1. To contain and retain all knowledge and information fed into it, however great the amount. 2. To feed itself additional information by peondiring all planets, wherever situate, bearing intelligent life. 3. To call up instantly any and all items of information pertaining to any problem we may give it. 4. To combine and recombine any number of items required to form new concepts. 5. To formulate theories, test them, and draw conclusions helpful to us in any manner in work. It will have been noticed that these specifications vary in one important respect from those of the ENIACs and UNIVACs of Earth. Since we of Earth cannot pay and dire, we do not expect that ability from our computers. The Strets could and did. When Sandra came back into the office at five o'clock, she found Hilton still sitting there, in almost exactly the same position. "'Come out of it, Jarve,' she snapped a finger. "'That much of that is just simply too damned much.' "'You're so right, child,' he got up, stretched, and by main strength shrugged off his foul mood. "'But we're up against something that is really a something, and I don't mean perchance.' "'How well I know it!' She put an arm around him, gave him a quick, hard hug. But, after all, you don't have to solve it this evening, you know. No, thank God. So why don't you and Temple have supper with me? Or better yet, why don't all eight of us have supper together in that bachelor's paradise of yours and Bill's? That'd be fun. And it was. Nor did it take a week for Beverly Bell to recover from the ordeal of eight. On the following evening, she herself suggested that the team should take another shot at that utterly fantastic terra incognita of the multiple mind, jolting though it had been. "'But are you sure you can take it again so soon?' Hilton asked. "'Sure. I'm like that famous gangster's mall, you know, who bruised easy but healed quick. And I want to know about it as much as anyone else does.' They could do it this time without any help from Thule. The linkage fairly snapped together and shrank instantaneously to a point. Hilton thought of Terra, and there it was, full size, yet occupying only one infinitesimal section of a dimensionless point. The multi-mind visited relatives of all eight, but could not make intelligent contact. If asleep, it caused pleasant dreams. If awake, pleasant thoughts of the loved one so far away in space but that was all. It visited mediums, in trance and otherwise, many of whom, not surprisingly now, were genuine, with whom it held lucid conversations. Even in linkage, however, the multi-mind knew that none of the mediums would be believed, even if they all told, simultaneously, exactly the same story. The multi-mind weakened suddenly, and Hilton snapped it back to Ardree. Beverly was almost in collapse. The other girls were white, shaken, and trembling. Hilton himself, strong and rugged as he was, felt as though he had done two weeks of hard labor on a rock-pile. He glanced questioningly at Larry. Point six three eight seconds, sir,' the omen said, holding up a millisecond timer. "'How do you explain that?' Carnes demanded. "'I'm afraid it means that without omen backing we're out of luck.' Hilton had other ideas, but he did not voice any of them until the following day, when he was rested and had Larry alone. So, carbon-based brains can't take it. One second of that stuff would have killed all eight of us. Why? The Masters have the same kind of brains we have. I don't know, sir. It's something completely new. No Master or group of Masters ever generated such a force as that. I can scarcely believe such power possible, even though I have felt it twice. It may be that, over the generations, your individual powers, never united or controlled, have developed so strength that no human can handle them in fusion. And none of us ever knew anything about any of them. I've been doing a lot of thinking. 
the masters had qualities and abilities now unknown to any of us. How come? You omens, and the Strets too, think we're descendants of the masters. Maybe we are. You think they came originally from Arth, Earth or Terra, to Ardu. That'd account for our legends of Mu, Atlantis and so on. Since Ardu was within Peondic's range of Stret, the Strets attacked it. They killed all the masters, they thought, and made the planet uninhabitable for any kind of life, even their own. But one shipload of masters escaped and came here to Ardri, far beyond Peondic's range. They stayed here for a long time. Then, for some reason or other, which may be some place in their records, they left here, fully intending to come back. Do any of you omens know why they left, or where they went? No, sir. We can read only the simplest of the Master's records. They arranged our brains that way, sir. I know. They're the type. However, I suspect now that your thinking is reversed. Let's turn it around. Say the Masters didn't come from Terra, but from some other planet. Say that they left here because they were dying out. They were, weren't they? Yes, sir. Their numbers became fewer and fewer each century. I was sure of it. They were committing race suicide by letting you omens do everything they themselves should have been doing. Finally, they saw the truth. In a desperate effort to save their race, they pulled out, leaving you here. Probably they intended to come back when they had bred enough guts back into themselves to set you omens down where you belong. But they were always the masters, sir. They were not. They were hopelessly enslaved. Think it over. Anyway, say they went to Terra from here. That still accounts for the legends and so on. However, they were too far gone to make a recovery, and yet they had enough fixity of purpose not to manufacture any of you omens there. So their descendants went a long way down the scale before they began to work back up. Does that make any sense to you? It explains many things, sir. It can very well be the truth. Okay. However it was, we're here and facing a condition that isn't funny. While we were teamed up, I learned a lot, but not nearly enough. Am I right in thinking that I now don't need the other seven at all, that my cells are fully charged and I can go it alone? Probably, sir, but I'm coming to that. Every time I do it, up to maximum performance, of course, it becomes easier and faster and hits harder. So next time, or maybe the fourth or fifth time, it'll kill me and the other seven, too, if they're along. I'm not sure, sir, but I think so. Nice. Very, very nice. Hilton got up, shoved both hands into his pockets, and prowled about the room. But can't the damn stuff be controlled? Choked, throttled down, uh, damped, muzzled, some way or other? We do not know of any way, sir. The masters were always working toward more power, not less. Well, that makes sense. The more power, the better, as long as you can handle it. But I can't handle this, and neither can the team. So, how about organizing another team, one that hasn't got quite so much whammo, enough punch to do the job, but not enough to backfire that way? It is highly improbable that such a team is possible, sir. If an omen could be acutely embarrassed, Larry was. That is, sir... I should tell you, sir, you certainly should. You've been stalling all along, and now you're stalled. Spill it. Yes, sir. The Thule begged me not to mention it, but I must. When it organized your team, it had no idea of what it was really going to do. Let's talk the same language, shall we? Say he and she, not it. She thought she was setting up the Peondix, the same as all of us omens have. But after she formed in your mind the Peondix Matrix, your mind went on of itself to form a something else, a thing we cannot understand. That was why she was so extremely, I think, frightened might be your term. I knew something was biting her. Why? Because it very nearly killed you. You perhaps have not considered the effect upon us all if any omen however unintentionally, should kill a master. No, I hadn't. I see. 
So she won't play with fire any more, and none of the rest of you can. Yes, sir. Nothing could force her to. If she could be so coerced, we would destroy her brain before she could act. That brain, as you know, is imperfect, or she could not have done what she did. It should have been destroyed long since. Don't ever act on that assumption, Larry. Hilton thought for minutes. Simple peyondix, such as yours, is not enough to read the master's records. If I'd had three brain cells working, I'd have tried them then. I wonder if I could read them. You have all the old master's powers and more, but you must not assemble them again, sir. It would mean death. But I've got to know. I've got to know. Anyway, a thousandth of a second would be enough. I don't think that'd hurt me very much. He concentrated, read a few feet of top-secret braided wire, and came back to consciousness in the sick bay of the Perseus, with two doctors working on him. Hastings, the top Navy medico, and Flandris, the surgeon. "'What the hell happened to you?' Flandris demanded. "'Were you trying to kill yourself?' "'And if so, how?' Hastings wanted to know. "'No, I was not trying to,' Hilton said weakly, "'and I guess I did much more than succeed. "'That was just about the closest shave I ever saw a man come through. "'Whatever it was, don't do it again.' "'I won't,' he promised feelingly. "'When they led him out of the hospital, four days later, "'he called in Larry and Tooley. "'The next time would be the last time, "'so there won't be any,' he told them. But just how sure are you that some other of our boys or girls may not have just enough of whatever it takes to do the job? Enough, Oompa, but not too much. Since we too are on strange ground, the probability is vanishingly small. We have been making inquiries, however, and scanning. You were selected from all the minds of Terra as the one having the widest vision, the greatest scope, the most comprehensive grasp the ablest at synthesis and correlation and so on. That's printing it in big letters, but that was more or less what they were after. Hence the probability approaches unity that any more such ignorant meddling as this obnoxious Thule did will result almost certainly in failure and death. Therefore we cannot and will not meddle again. You've got a point there. So what I am is some kind of freak, maybe a kind of supermaster and maybe something altogether different. Maybe duplicable in a less lethal fashion, and maybe not. Very helpful, I don't think. But I don't want to kill anybody either, especially if it wouldn't do any good. But we've got to do something. Hilton scowled in thought for minutes. But an omen brain could take it. As you told us, Tooley, the brain of the Larry is very, very tough. In a way, sir, except that the masters were very careful to make it physically impossible for any omen to go very far along that line. It was only their oversight of my one imperfect brain that enabled me, alone of us all, to do that wrong. Stop thinking it was wrong, Tooley. I'm mighty glad you did. But I wasn't thinking of any regular omen brain. Hilton's voice petered out. I see, sir. Yes, we can, by using your brain as guide, reproduce it in an omen body. You would then have the powers and most of the qualities of both. No, you don't see, because I've got my screen on, which I will now take off. He suited action to word. Since the whole planet's screened and I have nothing to hide from you. Teddy Blake and I both thought of that but we'll consider it only as the ultimately last resort. We don't want to live a million years, and we want our race to keep on developing. But you folks can replace carbon-based molecules with silicon-based ones just as easily as, and a hell of a lot faster than, mineral water petrifies wood. What can you do along the line of rebuilding me that way? And if you can do any such conversion, what would happen? Would I live at all? And if so, how long? How would I live? What would I live on? All that kind of stuff. 
Shortly before they left, two of the masters did some work on that very thing. Tooley and I converted them, sir. Fine. Or is it? How did it work out? Perfectly, sir, except that they destroyed themselves. It was thought that they wearied of existence. I don't wonder. Well, if it comes to that, I can do the same. You can convert me, then. Yes, sir. But before we do it, we must do enough preliminary work to be sure that you will not be harmed in any way. Also, there will be many more changes involved than simple substitution. Of course, I realize that. Just see what you can do, please, and let me know. We will, sir, and thank you very much. End of chapter 8